My name is Job, and this is my story. I was a wealthy man named Job, living in a region known as Uz. I had a large family and enormous flocks. I was always a righteous and just person, committed to living a moral life and maintaining a disciplined relationship with God. In the land of Uz, I was known for being blameless and honest, fearing God and shunning evil. I had seven sons and three daughters. I owned 7,000 sheep, 3,000 camels, 500 yoke of oxen, 500 donkeys, and a significant number of servants. I was considered the greatest among all the people of the East. My children used to celebrate feasts in their homes on their birthdays, inviting their three sisters to eat and drink with them. After a period of celebration, I would organize a purification ritual for them early in the morning, offering a burnt sacrifice for each, thinking that perhaps my children had sinned and cursed God in their hearts. This was my constant practice. God highlighted my virtues before Satan. However, Satan argued that I was righteous only because God favored me abundantly. One day, the angels came to present themselves before the Lord, and Satan was also among them. The Lord asked Satan, where have you come from? Satan replied to the Lord, from roaming throughout the earth, going back and forth on it. Then the Lord said to Satan, have you considered my servant Job? There is no one on earth like him. He is blameless and upright, fearing God and shunning evil. Does Job fear God for nothing? Satan replied, have you not put a hedge around him and his household and everything he has? You have blessed the work of his hands so that his flocks and herds are spread throughout the land. Satan challenged God, saying that if he were allowed to inflict suffering on me, I would surely change and curse God. God allowed Satan to torment me to prove this bold claim, but prohibited taking my life, saying, Stretch out your hand and strike everything he has, and he will surely curse you. God agreed, but warned Satan not to put his hand on the man himself. I received four pieces of news in a single day, informing me that my sheep, servants and ten children had died, victims of invaders, thieves or natural disasters. One day, while my sons and daughters were celebrating and drinking wine at the house of the eldest brother, a messenger came to me and said that the oxen were plowing and the donkeys were grazing nearby when the Sabaeans attacked and took them, killing the servants with the sword, and I was the only one who escaped to tell you. While he was still speaking, another messenger came and said that the fire of God fell from the sky and burned up the sheep and servants, and I was the only one who escaped to tell you. Still speaking, another messenger arrived, saying that the Chaldeans formed three raiding parties, launched a surprise attack on the camels, took them, and killed the servants with the sword, and I was the only one who managed to escape to inform you. Another messenger arrived, saying that your sons and daughters were feasting and drinking wine at the eldest brother's house, when suddenly a mighty wind came from the desert, and it reached the four corners of the house. It collapsed upon them and they died. In my mourning, I tore my clothes and shaved my head, yet I still praised God in my prayers. When I arose, tore my robe, shaved my head and prostrated on the ground, I worshipped, saying, Naked I came from my mother's womb, and naked shall I return. The Lord gave, and the Lord has taken away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Through all this I did not sin nor attribute any fault to God by saying, Naked I came from my mother's womb, and naked shall I return. The Lord gave, and the Lord has taken away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. I was acknowledging God's sovereignty over all things, including my own life and everything I possessed. Why did I continue to bless his name despite the immeasurable loss? Was it my unwavering faith or the acceptance that everything belongs to God and returns to him despite my broken heart? Being broken, I did not sin or blame God because I maintained my integrity and faith without attributing fault to God even when everything I loved was taken from me. Did I truly understand the transient nature of life and the eternity of divine things? Like Job, I resisted the pleas of my wife who tried to persuade me to curse God and renounce life despite my sufferings. I tried to endure them. In the course of this trial, two plots were skillfully intertwined in my life, one celestial and the other earthly. Eliphaz, Bildad and Zophar, three friends of mine, came to console me, sitting with me in silence for seven days in respect to my mourning. I spoke on the seventh day, initiating a dialogue in which each of the four men offered poetic descriptions of their troubles. 
I cursed the day of my birth, comparing life and death to light and darkness, wishing I had never been born and that my birth had been shrouded in darkness. Feeling that life only increased my agony, Eliphaz responded that I, who had previously consoled others, now admitted that I had never truly been aware of their suffering. Eliphaz concluded that my pain must be due to some sin I had committed and recommended seeking God's favor. Bildad and Zophar agreed that I must have committed some evil to provoke God's justice, arguing that I should try to demonstrate more innocent behavior. Bildad supposed that my children brought death upon themselves, and worse still, Zophar insinuated that any mistake I had made would deserve much more pain than I had received. Reflecting on the words of my friends, I, Job, pondered within myself. Eliphaz pointed out that I, who used to console, now seemed not to truly understand others' suffering. Was he right? Did my own pain reveal a lack of empathy before? Eliphaz believed that my suffering resulted from some sin I committed. Was that true? Did I fail in some way that I didn't realize attracting this adversity as a consequence? Bildad and Zophar also seemed convinced that I had committed some wrong to provoke God's justice. This made me question whether involuntary or unknown injustices on my part could have led to such calamities. Bildad went even further, suggesting that my children might have caused their own deaths through their actions. How could I accept that the tragedy that befell my innocent children was somehow deserved? Zophar taught me that any mistake of mine would deserve even more pain than I was facing. This led me to reflect deeply on the nature of suffering and divine justice. Is there a direct proportion between our faults and the sufferings we face? Am I truly suffering more than I deserve, or is there a higher purpose in this pain that I still cannot see? These words of my friends weighed on me. They tried to find reasons for my suffering, but their words often sounded like accusations. I struggled internally to understand the nature of divine justice and questioned whether there was something in my life that I needed to correct, or if this suffering was part of a greater unfathomable plan for human understanding. I reacted to each of these comments with such irritation that I called my sympathizers useless doctors who masked their help with lies. My ears heard and understood this. What do you know, I also know. I am not inferior to you, but I wish to speak with the Almighty and discuss my case with God. However, you defame me with lies. You're all useless doctors. In my reaction to the words of my friend Job, I dialogued with myself when I responded. I felt a deep irritation for feeling so strongly about their words. They were trying to help, but why did their words sound so empty and false to me? I called them useless doctors. Was I too harsh with them, or did they truly not understand my pain and suffering? I said to them, my ears have heard and understood this. What do you know? I also know I am not inferior to you, because I felt the need to affirm my understanding and knowledge. Did I feel that they saw me as ignorant about the ways of God and the reasons for human suffering? I wanted them to know that I also sought answers, and that I was no less wise or understanding than they were. But what I truly desired was to speak with the Almighty, to discuss my case directly with God because the presence of God seemed like the only solution for me. Was it because only God could truly understand what I was going through and offer the answers I sought? They defamed me with lies, or was it just their interpretation, trying to make sense of the situation? Why did their words sound so empty and lacking understanding to me? Was true help and comfort only possible through a genuine and direct encounter with God, not through human words and rationalizations? These thoughts haunted me as I struggled with my suffering and the quest for answers. Was my irritation a reflection of my own distress and confusion, or a fair response to the lack of true empathy and understanding from my friends? I questioned why God judges people based on their actions when he could easily correct or forgive those acts. I was perplexed about how a human being could completely satisfy God's justice, given that God's ways are mysterious and beyond human understanding. Furthermore, humans cannot convince God with their words, God cannot be deceived. I admitted that I did not even know enough to defend my case before God. I longed for someone who could mediate between me and God, so that I would not be condemned to Sheol, the underworld. I believed that in heaven there was a witness or redeemer who would testify to my integrity. I know that my redeemer lives and that in the end he will stand upon the earth. Even now my witness is in heaven, my advocate is on high. 
Why was this need for a mediator so strong in my heart? I did not want to be condemned to Sheol, the dark underworld. Did my yearning for a Redeemer reveal a profound understanding of the need for intercession in the relationship between the human and the divine? I firmly believed that in heaven there was a witness or a Redeemer who would testify to my integrity. I know that my Redeemer lives and that in the end he will stand upon the earth. These words expressed my unwavering faith in a higher justice. But who would be this Redeemer? A celestial figure, an angel, or an aspect of God himself? How did I know of this existence? Was it a conviction born of faith or desperation? Even now my witness is in heaven, my advocate is on high. This idea brought me comfort. There was someone, some celestial being, who knew my truth, my integrity and my innocence. Did this mean that despite being unjustly treated on earth, there was divine recognition of my situation? Did this belief in a celestial redeemer make me feel that, although wrong on earth, I would have my cause justified in heaven? Did this reflect a profound understanding that true justice goes beyond what is seen and understood on the earthly plane? Was my faith anchored not only in the hope of earthly relief, but in the certainty of divine and eternal vindication? These thoughts about a mediator between me and God made me ponder the nature of the human relationship with the divine. Do all of us in our darkest and most confusing moments long for this type of intercession and understanding that transcends the mundane and touches the divine? The suffering became unbearable for me, and I became bitter, anxious, and frightened. I lamented the injustice of God in allowing evil people to prosper while I and many other honest individuals suffered. I wanted to confront God and protest, but I couldn't find Him physically. I thought that wisdom was hidden from humanity, but I decided to pursue it, fearing God and avoiding evil. Eventually, God intervened in the dialogue. During my speeches, I asked God 36 times to speak to me. Now my wish was granted. On the two occasions when God spoke to me, it happened in the midst of a storm. There was a certain humor in the way God addressed me. I was reminded by God that He is the creator of everything. God recounted His impressive activity of creating and sustaining the world, asking me if I could match that work. He ended by asking if I was in a position to judge, stating that it was impertinent for me to believe that God should explain Himself to me. I was made to feel very small. Eventually I replied, I am unworthy, how can I answer you? I placed my hand over my mouth. I spoke once, but there was no response, twice, but I won't say anything more. In the second encounter, God did not speak about himself as the creator, but about two of his creatures. Interestingly, it was filled with humor. Once again, he asked me about my thoughts regarding the hippopotamus, the behemoth, and the crocodile leviathan, as if these incredible beasts held the answers to life's big questions. I was reminded that I cannot understand God, the animal world, and even less the moral world. I thought to myself, when I finally spoke to God, all I could say was, I am unworthy, how can I answer you? Why did I feel so small and speechless before him? I placed my hand over my mouth, a gesture of silence and humility. After so long of asking for an answer, when I finally had the chance to speak, I felt I had nothing to say. I spoke once, but there was no response. What does this say about my journey? Did I realize that some answers I sought were simply beyond my human understanding, that there are mysteries in life and in the divine order that I cannot comprehend? In the second encounter, God shifted the focus of the conversation. He did not speak about himself as the creator, but about two of his creatures, the hippopotamus, the behemoth, and the crocodile leviathan. Why did God choose to talk about these beings? What was the meaning behind it? These powerful, mysterious, and feared animals. Why were they used to illustrate God's point? God's approach was full of humor. Why would God use humor in such a critical moment of my life? Perhaps it was to show me that despite the gravity of my situation, there is still room for a lighter view of existence. He asked me about my thoughts regarding these creatures was the intention to make me see that, just as I don't fully understand these formidable creatures, I also cannot fully understand God's ways. I was reminded that my understanding is limited, not only concerning the natural world, but also the moral and spiritual world. These reflections led me to a deeper humility. 
I understood that there are things beyond my understanding and that wisdom does not reside in having all the answers, but in recognizing and accepting the grandeur and mystery of the universe and its creator. So the main point of God was, why are you trying to argue with me? I responded that God is omniscient and no plan of his can be thwarted. Now I realized that my questioning of God was entirely inappropriate. I despised myself and repented in ashes and dust. Although the encounter with God was humiliating for me, the core of my problem was addressed. Since I reconnected with God, the dialogue offered a magnificent and unexpected climax to the book. In the epilogue, the text shifts from poetry to prose. When I accepted not to blame God for my interactions with him, God restored me children, seven sons and three daughters, properties, camels and flocks of sheep, making me much richer and happier than before. As a servant of God, I was rehabilitated. On the other hand, my three friends were severely rebuked by God. He said they did not speak correctly about me, indicating that we should not quote his speeches as if they were truths. The remarkable aspect of the two rounds of God with me is that he still did not answer my inquiries and did not tell me about his bet with Satan. I did not need to know what was happening in heaven because God had his reasons to allow me to suffer. I was unaware of the divine bet. The test would be useless if I knew. This encounter teaches valuable truths about Satan. Firstly, it suggests that he cannot be in two places at the same time, lacking God's omnipresence. Would my faith and integrity have been genuine if I were aware of the challenge behind my suffering? Perhaps the true nature of faith lies precisely in believing and trusting without seeing the complete picture. This situation also makes me reflect on Satan. It was revealed to me that he does not possess God's omnipresence, thus it is significant. This implies that, unlike God who is present everywhere and knows all hearts, Satan has limitations. He cannot be in every place at once. This diminishes his power and influence compared to divine omnipresence. Does this also mean that the evil in the world represented by Satan has its limitations and cannot equal the power and presence of God? This offers me some comfort knowing that even in the midst of my suffering God is present while the forces of evil are somehow limited. This revelation about Satan opened my eyes to the reality that although evil exists and can cause suffering, it is not omnipotent nor omnipresent. God in his omnipresence and omniscience has a greater plan that transcends the limitations of evil. Perhaps there is a lesson here about the relative power of good and evil and where the true supremacy and constant presence lie. Why was I suffering more than other people? This was the central question addressed. There are two perspectives. Firstly, my friends were convinced that my suffering was due to my sin. Secondly, I was convinced that I was not sinning and protested my innocence. What was my greatest pain? This clarifies the importance of this theme. It was a physical action. I was covered in sores from head to toe, tired, exhausted, and in unbearable pain. Socially, due to my physical appearance and the fact that the local community was aware of my recent tragedy, I became a social outcast. People walked on the other side of the street instead of talking to me while I sat on a heap of ashes at the edge of the city. Even teenagers laughed at me. Mentally, I faced the mental pain of not knowing why these distressing things were happening, especially since there seemed to be nothing in my past indicating it. Spiritually, my spiritual distress was much worse than any other, as I felt distant from God. I cried, begging God to find me, speak to me, and even argue with me. This was my true and most unbearable suffering. It is much more agonizing if we believe that God is distant and uninterested. However, when I finally managed to speak to God, things did not happen as I had planned. For Christians, the book of my story can be seen in the context of the New Testament. Firstly, God allowed Satan to provoke the death of Jesus on the cross, with his own son asking, My God, why have you forsaken me? Just like with me, God did not explain why. This suggests that even the Son of God lost touch with the purpose of his suffering under the intensity of the crucifixion torment. Secondly, Christians understand that life continues beyond death. The problems of suffering do not need to be resolved in this life. It is interesting to note that in the Greek version of the book of my story, an additional verse was added affirming that I would rise again with those whom the Lord resurrects. Thirdly, this hope of resurrection reminds us that there will be a final claim of me. 
Christians believe that Jesus will return to judge the living and the dead at the end of times. One day, there will be a courtroom scene where Jesus will sit as a judge, and all the wicked and righteous people who lived will stand before his throne to be judged according to their actions in life. Therefore, everything I longed for was about to become a reality. The justice of God will be applied to the entire human race in a public claim for justice. By exploring my story, we discover that the lessons of faith, resilience and justice are more relevant than ever. But the journey does not end here. We have much more to discover together. Each story we share is a new opportunity to unravel mysteries, find inspiration and transform our perception of the world. So don't miss out, subscribe to the channel now and activate notifications to never miss an adventure. Your like is very important to us as it helps us reach more people with these powerful messages. Comment below your reflections and share the video with friends and family who would also benefit from these extraordinary stories. Together, we will continue our journey in search of wisdom and inspiration. See you in the next video as we conclude another chapter together.